there are a few topics, a few points uh, that I'd like, like to make uh, tonight. I, I, I want to talk about uh, public, uh, public administration and public governance. I want to share with you some uh, examples um, that are outside of New Zealand in a Asia Pacific and why they may, may be re relevant or not. And the more general theme of uh, New Zealand making contributions to the world in the area of, of uh, public administration and the role of our school government in particular. Um, just before I go on though, about the public administration, one of the questions that I do often get, and I think my colleagues too, when we leave the capital city, not so much in a capital city anywhere in the world, but outside of capital cities, what is public administration? And that's really a surprising question, um, not only, only to me because maybe I've studied that, but just in, in, uh, in general because you don't get that same question about business administration. There's nobody going to ask what is business administration when presumes to know that, but when it comes to public uh, the side, that, that's somewhat of a question. Um, I think it's also very surprising because public administration is everywhere, it's in so many different places. It shows up so often, and as a measure of GDP, you know, most expenditures in the public purpose is about you know, 25 to 45 percent of, uh, percent of GDP in most countries. Probably about 15 percent of all workers work directly on, on, on the public payroll. And those who are dependent on the public purse, well, that's probably you know, double that. So it's sort of surprising that there's so many places throughout the world, it's not a New Zealand thing, it's everywhere. People want to know what, what is the public administration. Well, in the spirit of a picture speaks a thousand words, here is more than just one picture. You know? And so you know, what are some Im images of the public administration that a person might, might have? Well, when you Google public administration, actually it shows up off in our public buildings. And this is one of the buildings that that one has. Um, you know, you're familiar with this one, this is another building, so on. And what these buildings have in common, I think, is that they are designed to impress. They're designed to impress you. And they're also actually impressing to the point of maybe even imposing a little bit, perhaps. But they're certainly there to convey a message of stability and security. And maybe it's not a coincidence that this kind of design often came around the 1930s, uh, just during, during very, very difficult periods. Another th feature about these buildings is that they often don't include any people. Um, so buildings like this you will find in many, many state capitals when they were designed in the, in the 1920s, thereabout. I honestly don't know where this one is. But they put some people there because, you know, we deal with public, you know. So here are some people on, uh, just from down there on the left of Lambton Key. So this is the people on Lambton Key marching through wherever that, that, that might be. I think it's reported that New Zealand has a big presence. Okay, so I'm jump there. But okay, well, anyway, here's, here's some pictures of some uh, school children, obviously. And public administration is involved with them in, ma in many ways. Um, public administration may be paying the uh, salaries of their teachers, for example. It may be paying for the buildings. Maybe pay, paying for the school books, it, uh, issues of the <coughs> curriculum, um, what 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 gets taught, also ensuring that the students actually learn something through maybe centralized final exams or entrance exams or, or whatever system people have. And also ensuring that uh, schools uh, perform and that uh, there's some consequences for, for for schools that might not. So public administration is really involved in many things. Um, uh, public administration. Here's, here's a guy who's. Well, I'm not quite sure. Either he's a scientist, so public administration funds a lot of science, or this guy's holding something is going to give those children a little shock. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're concerned about the latest gear on the health side, uh, 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 Ebola for now, you know, this, these are most articles right now about where vaccines are being developed and fast speed are all government labs. You don't hear this coming out of the private sector. It's a government lab where people are working overtime. Government also in agriculture. This looks just your downtown, but in most places in the world, economic development is um, fully supported and directed by by uh, lo local gov governments working in concert with others to create a sense of economic strategic planning. Those are where the nice things happen. And here in New, New Zealand, that is very very clear to to see in this very beautiful city. Finally, on this thing, uh, the government also is associated with with many uh, monuments and achievements. Um, you know, the Eiffel Tower is very iconic and a very good uh, tourist attraction. Um, other achievements of Space Shuttle, which these days is also a very popular tourist attraction. If your museum is lucky to have one, it will bring a lot of visitors to it. And of course, here's an, here's an older one from some other, other, other times. So uh, maybe with the public administration being 
in so many different places all the time, maybe people are uh, confused about what it is, but if you wanted to get a definition, then clearly public administration is about the administration and often sometimes the development of government policies and programs that in one way or another further the uh, wel welfare and security of, uh, of its people. That's, that is basically what, what uh, uh, this uh, enterprise is about. Now, the, uh, the question, of course, then comes, um, well, how do you achieve success in all of these different areas that you endeavor in agriculture, in, in, in medicine, in school, and like so? And that was a classic question to be asked about, about 125 years ago with the development of large agencies that sort of followed the uh, industrial re revolution. Um, different answers were given to that. A very n notable one uh, from a Luther, Luther Gullick and Lind Lyndon Earl, who wrote some notes to President Ro Roosevelt's uh, Committee on Administrative Management in 1937. Looking around, he, he felt that um, uh, directors of agencies and I think today most managers should be engaging in what he called pot score. Everything needs an acronym to remember. Whether this is a memorable acronym, I don't know. But, it's, but you know, you and I, if you're working for the public service, you, you and I are probably have having pot scorers one way or another. Pot scoring is what we did. The pot score, as you can read behind me, stands for planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, re reporting, and budgeting. Now, why would I bring something up out of 1937? You know, don't we have something better to do, something more modern? Well, the reason is, of course, as you can see, that it is still very relevant for, for, for today. Um, if you look at a curriculum of public administration, what you do, we don't call it planning, we call it strategic planning. And we have a course on that. Um, organizing, actually we haven't been teaching, we teach organiza uh, organizational behavior, but organizing has fallen a little bit out of focus, but actually one of my colleagues constantly reminds me that, Berman, we need a course on that, really. Um, staffing, we call uh, uh, human re resource management. You think it's called staffing at HRM. Directing is an interesting one that clearly has fallen out of style as a leadership style, by the way. We call it leadership. But what's uh, interesting is that the people who do leadership are referred to as directors. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it still uh, uh, li lives on. Uh, coordinating uh, reporting, maybe program evaluation policy evaluation, but if you're in a business school, accounting, and like so, and budgeting, which in, in our area will probably be split today between uh, uh, public budgeting and public finance. Now, of course, some things were not around in 1937, like e-government. So um, uh, we, we have, in fact, uh, 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 an entire program, a master's uh, on uh, e-government, e e which is also very distinctive of Victoria. Another thing I think why this is relevant, it also explains why a school of government might be in a school of business, which is very important. But in many countries, a school of government might be in political science. But I think it says something about the practice of public administration, public management in New Zealand, that it is part of business, because people in business and public administration find things in common. There is commonality in, in the concern for planning. There's a concern, uh, uh, Faculty, professors, my colleagues in the business school, we find commonality in the human resource management area. We find commonality in leadership. We find com commonalities in, in concerns of financing or accounting. And our students would, would surely also take courses from our business colleagues and, and, and uh, vice versa. So this is the internal focus of maybe how to make an agency work and, and the kind of skills that someone might, might need. Um, but life has also evolved a little bit, and certainly in the last 20 years, one is more likely to be talking about public governance. And uh, that is defined not as an internal management, but rather as a management of public affairs uh, and, and public issues in general. And it really has evolved, it evolved from looking at an internal focus to focusing on how the public sector can make a difference in, in tackling the major issues of the day in countries. Now, as a sidebar comment, uh, when I was in Florida, I did a lot of citizen surveys. And some of the issues would come up as the number one concerns for, for uh, the citizens over and over and over again, no matter where you did that, whether you did it in Florida or in other states. And it looked also probably in Europe too. And some of the top issues would be around public safety, crime, education, uh, environment, and transportation. So yeah, like, so those, those, those are the ones that usually would come up. It would vary from community a little bit. But those would come up. You started to think, what is it that public safety, education, and environment have in common that other things on the list of 27 other priorities might not be. And it really stumped a lot of people, and me too, for several years, until it sort of dawned on us that it's the complexity of those issues 
that single agencies are having problems to respond to. Really, when it comes to education, there is no meaningful difference that a school can make without the participation of parents. When you look at building roads, it's very difficult for any state department of transportation to build roads without working with, with many other cities that are involved in that. They can't do it alone. When it comes to public safety, there's only so much that a police department can do. If you don't have cooperation from the businesses and the neighborhoods and so on, it's just not, not, not going to work. So our discipline has evolved a little bit to what looks like this, where the outer boundaries might refer to an issue area, and this deals with then or, or organizations working together, crossing jurisdictions, different levels, different horizontally, vertical, to, to, to try to resolve that. And all of that, of course, public governance is still very much led, led by, by the public sector. Someone, some organizations, public sectors don't lead. This is just, it just does not, you know, countries and uh, communities simply will, will not make, make enough difference. So this is sort of where we are, and I think it's important to explain because, as I said, people often don't know what we do, so I'm telling you what, what it is that we do. Now, there have, have been uh, also some important trends, and I could easily spend an entire paper or course or two on each of them, probably. But there is a quick story to be told here about how things are evolving in, in the world. In the last 20, uh, last 20 years, there's clearly a focus on lo local go governments. People love their cities. National governments, not always so sure. But people are creating, in the world, creating many, 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 many cities. If it's a developing country, um, getting the national government to decentralize the province is very clear in a country like uh, 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 in Indonesia or the Philippines. Empowering the province is very important. With more developed countries, even authorities in the states, uh, people are surprised actually how many governments we have in the states. People on the outside say, well, America is you know, one government. Now, on the record, there are 80, 87,000 different governments, and the federal government is one. Of those, about 50,000 are actually functioning governments. If you don't like general taxes, well, you make a hospital. It's not, not only a taxing district, but you can elect officials to the board of that. Um, uh, uh, many things are, are their own jurisdiction now. Uh, uh, highways, schools, the list goes on and on. So people like things decentralized, and they like, like a lot of it. Information, as, as you all know, has also changed over the last, last 20 years, really changing the business models of how governments are operating, very much so. Um, E-government is, is here, it's very important, and we're very, very proud to have a program on that. Not only are we going down, we're also going out internationally. There is this thing about people learning from each other. People wake up, they look at TV, they see what other countries have, and they wonder, well, why can't we do that too? Maybe not always citizens, but the leaders of the institutions uh, for sure. Are we becoming a global village? I don't want to over-romanticize it, but yeah, yeah, we travel very, very easily and more so. Now, with that, with the above is a diffusion of uh, capabilities and expectations. The world is becoming less different than what it probably was 50 years ago, I think. There is convergence. There are huge differences. If anybody thinks the whole world is the same, just get on a plane. There are huge differences, but the differences are becoming less and less. Less and less. We having so, which means that we have more and more in common. And the question then becomes how we can take advantage of having more and more uh, in common. You take this together, and the old uh, bumper sticker of you know, <coughs> "Think Global, Act Local" is very valid. This is what it's all about. And so, for people who do public administration or focus on place, on the city, jurisdictions like so, an issue for leaders is a leadership of place. How can we make our place distinctive? How can, we make, how can we make our place one of the best places that people want to come to? And if you believe in a market economy, then the kind of place that, that people of, of, of great scale and the potential and companies want to come to. Creating the best place becomes very, very, uh, very uh, uh, important. And public administration is all over the place on that one. This is just very, very key. Interesting paradox that I see is that in the um, diffusion of capability and expectation is rising performance. I mean, living standards are going up for people around the world. The quality of life is getting better generally in the world. It's all very true. But with that, um, I also see more me mediocrity. Mediocrity is also everywhere. Simply, I think it's, you know, it's easier to build a hospital, there's enough money for that, than to have excellent public health care. 
It's easier to build a row than to build a row that lasts. It's easier actually to build, to put buildings here in a university than to, than, than to, than to provide a high quality of the education and to have excellent world class professors to actually come. There's a lot, a lot of work and leadership that is necessary for that. And so some of the, uh, the areas that one focuses on these days is, is on the management of values and the management of performance. I actually wrote an article uh, about 20 years ago that had as titled Values Management. Now granted, I was probably one of the first and it wasn't very well, and da, 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 but people said that values management, you can never manage that. Well, guess what? If you ask what is the job of a leader, this is clearly what it is, setting the values. Uh, and uh, uh, performance management, that is what people are more familiar with. And all of this doesn't lead up to one brilliant grand paradigm. I think all these uh, 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 efforts, all, all these areas of focus, are channeled in, into specific er areas, such as health. And how values management plays out is different in health than it is in the environment, as than in public finance, than in security, and so on and so forth. So these, uh, all these different areas find, find different uh, expressions. And on top of that, I think there's a, you know, a broader theme about it's nice to be pro-democracy and, and all that. That's all really nice. But truthfully, um, people are focused on government performance, and there are things to learn from China. You might not like their system, but there, there are some results of that they do that are actually quite well. So learning from each other, even if you don't like their system, but what is going on there? What, what could we take? This uh, uh, becomes increasingly uh, uh, what we are doing. Just a sidebar, I, I take this occasion as an opportunity for myself to also introduce my, myself to uh, folks in the Wel Wellington. So just a few autobiographical notes before I go on, perhaps. Um, yes, I have U.S. parents, and you can probably hear my accent, but actually I have a Dutch stepfather. So uh, I grew up in Holland, and I speak Dutch as well. Yeah, um, uh, raised in Amsterdam. When I was uh, being raised in Amsterdam, uh, I often visited my father, though, was either working in, in America or in Africa. So many countries in that, that you hear uh, in the news today in Africa, I've spent long periods of time in. Okay. Um, like many people in the world, uh, I went to the US, some people go to the UK here, but uh, I went to the US to get a PhD. And I did not intend to stay in the US, actually, but it did work, work out that way. And the boy from Amsterdam gets a job offered in Miami. I think he's going to go to Miami. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Location, place matters. <laughs> for sure, for sure, for sure. And, and as the vice chancellor said, I, I ended up in Louisiana. My wife is from, from Brazil. So you started to see an international focus here, a little international orientation a little bit. Um, along the way, I think no one can live a life without having some uh, hardship or, or issues come their way. Uh, we had two, uh, two hurricanes, two major ones, uh, Andrew and uh, Katrina. We'll uh, talk a little bit about that later. It's been five years in Taiwan. Why I went to Taiwan, giving up a very uh, distinguished job in Louisiana, well, part of it had to, had to do with the hurricane. But, but the other part was, was the opportunity. The, uh, the, the opportunity that I saw around the year 2000 was a, 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 an enormous need. Scientists go out to where there are new things. That's what we do. It's where is a new knowledge to be created? Where does the world need? Where do we believe new knowledge needs to be created? And I believe, uh, along with others, that we need a new knowledge about public governance out of East Asia. And for some reason, East Asians weren't producing that. The East Asians who were in America, they were doing American things. And the scholarship just wasn't coming out of there. And I felt it would take someone like myself, a senior scholar, to go and live there and work with local professors to produce the kind of knowledge that the rest of the world want, wants to see. And there's a very important point here about myself, is that when I went to Taiwan, people would say, well, what are you going to do in Taiwan? Your Chinese is very wuhau, and it's very bad. I said, well, this is true. So, you know, 90% of, of scientists will do what I call import. They will take from the world and ask themselves, how can I take from the world to make my country, my community better? And that's very brilliant, it's very excellent, and that's what the focus should be. But I submit to you that 10% that of those scientists better be thinking export. I do export. I was asking the question, what is there about Taiwan and East Asia that the rest of the world might want to know about? And I think that's a very important question too. And in doing that, you have to ask questions and you inform the domestic effort and you transform the domestic effort as a result of looking at things that other people outside of your region are interested in. Because a local conversation, a local political conversation is not the only conversation that is, that is important. And so that, that tells you a little bit about what I, I am about. And in my role here in the School of Government, I'm trying to, to further the connections between the Arab School, School of Government and international conversations that occur elsewhere. 
Um, but the areas that I, that I do, uh, the Vice Chancellor mentioned, and those mentioned here as well, uh, I might add that I teach the Elite Leadership course uh, in, in our programs at the School of Government, and I'm also a lead author of the, um, uh, uh, the top text on the HRM. Now, before I give you some, some examples, um, I want to talk a little bit about what I did in Taiwan to give you even more uh, a flavor of things. Um, yeah, I, I directed and, and, the, and the help, 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 help to create an international program. The Thai Taiwanese president, uh, many years ago, about 15 years ago, decided that its top universities, where all the courses are in Chinese, should offer programs taught in English so that people from around the world could come to, to Taiwan and learn about Taiwan and China. And to do that, um, programs were created where courses were taught in English. In fact, very challenging. All the administration for the students was done in English as well. Now you think about what that would mean at Vic International if you needed to have staff that would speak you know, other languages than English. So this was a very high bar that, that the un un university set, and that was a very uh, 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 interesting time for me to give a shape to that. But one of the things that I did there was also produce three books. And these uh, books um, were, uh, they contained 78 chapters uh, written by 110 scholars from Japan to Pakistan. Um, it's about 1,400 pages in total. And they include chapters of topics that are commonly taught in a public governance curriculum. If you want to know something about, about uh, public, uh, public performance management reforms, you can now go and find texts that look at the, the developments in Japan and compare that against Pakistan or India or the Philippines or other places. If you're interested about uh, integrity and ethics and corruption, here's a source to uh, do that. You can get it local different countries. What's interesting is all these chapters are written by people of, of those countries. They certainly didn't need somebody from America who grew up in Holland to be writing about, about ethics in Malaysia. Right? So this also created a network for us of scholars that didn't exist before and, and uh, that uh, we, 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 we can now draw on. One of the examples was uh, an article, some research done in, a, in the uh, top uh, journal of uh, public personnel looking at the impact of human resource management on the uh, on pu public executive leadership, which is interesting, Bob, because in business, people look at leadership that affecting human resource management, look at human resource management as a tool for implementing leadership. But in public sector, we actually have the other experience where the quality of human resource management limits or opens up what leaders can actually do. Well, so let, me, let, me, let me talk a little bit about learning from, uh, from others here. Um, and start with a personal uh, a story here, I guess. How do officials learn from others in the world? Since that is a theme uh, that I want to talk about. Well, they not so much go to conferences, they visit other, other officials who do the same kind of work that they do in their offices in other countries. Sometimes they, they, they meet these other people in conferences, but eventually they visit. Well, this is one experience that, that I had. Um, um, on the 7th, 7th of March 2011, a group from the Japan Local Government Emergency Management Association visited us at National Changchi University in Taiwan to talk about uh, survivors' experiences of major tragedies. Japan had not had a major tragedy. The uh, uh, interesting thing here, by the way, is that they visited on the 7th of March and the Fukushima uh, uh, earth earthquake and tsunami was on the 11th of March. So they came, you yeah, know, like so. Um, this is a picture that I showed them, by the way, and they had, had not actually thought about it in this way until they actually came. So this is Hurricane Katrina before it made landfall in, in New Orleans, and this is a map of Japan about to, about to scale. And it dawned on them that, oh, this was not just a local event. If Katrina came to Japan, it would wipe out all of Japan. And so these are the kinds of experiences people get when they really engage with others and not only look at the newspaper, really start to understand. And they wanted to hear my, my opinion, not only as a scholar, and I wrote, of course, by Katrina because I was there, but also my personal experiences. So just to share with you some more personal experiences. So this is our house in, in New Orleans with two trees against it. It's about uh, three, uh, three weeks later. The grass is green, but really the grass is already dead. It just hasn't turned brown. Brown happened a bit later. This is what much of the neighborhood would look like. This is a major bridge across Lake Pontchartrain. Um, very, very key for traffic and commuting and all that kind of stuff. So go on and re rebuild that one. And um, governments learn from experience. Um, there was no book on that. And
And one of the lessons was you need to get people close to their home to fix up their home because government doesn't have the resources to pick up to fix up people's home. Now at Christ Church, you know that, but who knew this 10 years ago? The bottom line question is, what new lessons are there from Christ Church that New Zealand wants to contribute to the world? Very important question. Very important question. You can't just take from the world, you have to give to the world too. Anyway, one of the lessons here was FEMA trailers. Give people a trailer so that they, they can live close to their home, and when, when they're close to their home, they will have enough incentive to uh, go fix it. Um, this is just a little picture of an inundated neighborhood. This might not look like very much, but all these homes that are just even a bit off their pilings, that is catastrophic damage that cannot be fixed. Uh, uh, this, uh, people often talk about uh, human uh, toll, like so. There were about 1,700 people who died in Katrina, and another 800 people who are still missing. Those bodies are who knows where. But uh, it was actually the actually largest disaster for, for uh, animals. About, uh, it's estimated about 40,000 animals died. Uh, when we got back three weeks uh, later, a couple of days later, this little, little evening push on this side showed up, and somehow she survived. So we took her in, and she's still with us to today. She's gone from New Orleans to Taipei to, to Wellington. And yes, she has a Kiwi boyfriend, in case you want to get out. <laughs> she does, she does, she does. Life does go on. This is what the, what, what the house look, looked like uh, just uh, last week. So. Now, I want to give you, so people learn from personal experiences. They visit people. and. Uh, there are stories to be told, and you, you take a little from here, you live to there, and you think, well, you think, well, gee, if I had to plan for this in Wellington or New Zealand, what would I do? Um, sometimes there's more serious research associated with, with things. Uh, here's a story from, uh, from Seoul. Uh, mayor O was, uh, elected, uh, was, was, uh, was elected in 2006. He was mayor for about five years. And his vision was to transform Seoul from a good city to a great city. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Seoul. I've been to Seoul many, many times. It's a big city, about the 20 million people who live in the greater area. This, the jurisdiction of Seoul is 10 million, so 10 million in Seoul, you know, another 10 million beyond. The uh, city of Seoul has about 45,000 people working for it, about 15,000 people for the metropolitan, and then Seoul is divided in 25 districts in which another 25 people or 25,000 people work. So the entire um, civil service of uh, Seoul Metropolitan Government is about what you, for you, what you use to manage the entire New Zealand, just to give you the economy of scale there. Anyway, his idea was to, make, to transform Seoul from a good city to a great city. And to do that, he, uh, as all new leaders do, they uh, do some strategic planning, uh, talk to important leaders inside and outside, and say, what can we do? You know, where do I have, have your support? Um, what are some targets that we can achieve now and in the future? And what came out of it was a need to transform the way they do leadership. It used to be, or it still is today, that in East Asia, the new leader will leave a legacy of a few great grand projects, very important projects, maybe something like a subway system, an Eiffel Tower, uh, whatever it is. But he felt in order to make Seoul a great city, when he said great city, we're talking about the people should in the future be talking about Seoul, uh, you know, London, New York, Paris, Seoul. Not quite get there, but, but that's the vision. So how do we get to London, Paris, and like so? Which is uh, you know, relevant for, for, for many cities. So he felt, in addition to a few big projects, you needed to have all these civil servants, all these 40,000 civil servants come up, come up with new ideas, and be a fountain of creativity, and that there would be not, not, not just you know, 10 big ideas or 100 ideas, not even 1,000, there would be 5,000 ideas come up, and that would, over time, transform the city. That is a a major change, major change. You don't see that every day. And uh, the uh, specific vision would be that a great city would have those five pillars of economic vitality, culture, welfare, fresh air, and uh, civic participation. By the way, having somebody talk in 2006 about a city of fresh air is really a leader who is a bit ahead of, ahead of their, their time. To make a long story short, the, the basic idea was that the mayor said, if you've been working in the city of Seoul and you want to have a promotion or like so, you should be able to come up with an idea for improving your workplace or the city of Seoul. And we will expect you to come up with ideas. Think of it as a large suggestion box but an, of an electronic Samsung kind of, kind of kind. And we will evaluate those ideas. And you will be rewarded based on the creativity and innovativeness of your idea. Not whether or not we adopt the idea, because that could depend on budget and the circumstances that you don't have any control over. 
So that you, you'll be evaluated on whether, whether you adopt them or not. Well, what happened was that over a two-year period, um, the civil servants submitted 62,000 ideas. And over a five-year period, they submitted almost a quarter of a million ideas. I have no sympathy for the Marsden Fund, who may have, have, have to evaluate, I don't know how many proposals, okay, or the National Science Foundation like so. So you have a city who is evaluating a quarter of a million ideas, and they found a way to do that. I don't have time, time tonight to go into that, but the transformative impact of this was enormous. When asked the people before 2006, before the mayor took over, how innovative is your division, which their term for like section or bureau, something small, about 16% said that, that their, their division was uh, innovative or very innovative. Okay. After 2006, after this, this ran for a couple of years, the percentage was 33%. When 33% of your workers say that, that your place to work is innovative, you have reached the tipping point. Good things are going to come. And if you compare how Seoul developed against other cities of similar kinds, such as tai, tai, Taipei and Taiwan and other cities, Seoul has really made enormous gains over 10 years, where other cities are still fine, but they're still the same. The citizens may still be happy, but there's some other place that is really, really doing much better. Um, just as some short ideas, so somebody came up with the idea that the Seoul should have a, um, a floating opera house on the Han River. This is the Han River. Okay, three years later, they, they have the foundation, and today they have a, a opera house on, on the Han River. An engineer came, came up with the idea of having the world's longest falling water, mountain, or whatever, over a bridge. And this changes color, so they got this, this guy got the promoted for that, too. Um, there was, so there were some really big ideas, but there were some very small ideas, and here's an idea maybe for Wellington, I don't know, some other city. The question came up, how to fund social services? Hard economy, difficult to fund, like so. Well, um, at the exit of their uh, subway stations, they put a li little device here that people could swap their, swipe their, their snapper card, if you will, their snapper card, and automatically a very small donation would, do, would be taken. I don't know how much, let's say 50 cents. Let's go try to see what happens. Turns out it raised an enormous amount of money for the social services in Seoul much more than they ever had been before. Very, very uh, successful. And guess what? People like to give. But you have to make it possible for them to give. So there are a lot of ideas, and this is just some of the ideas that this thing came out. Obviously not all of these uh, quarter of a million ideas are good, but there were like at least 5,000 great ideas there that, that really made a difference. There were other ideas that I could give too, but for the sake of time, I won't go there. Another idea of the May was how to make Seoul the most woman-friendly city in Asia. There's a politician for you. <laughs> but I came up with, uh, with very, very good ideas. Ideas that could be helpful in other places, if you thought about it. Now, some key questions before I go on. But you may be sitting here and thinking, especially if you're a department head or a chief executive or a deputy chief executive, you know, is this something I want to do in my office? Probably saying, quarter million ideas, please not. <laughs> so, but so one question you may, one conversation maybe in your mind is how is this relevant to us? How can we use this? And you have to make your own determination with some version on this, whether you do or not. That's up to you. But here's a much broader uh, point of view that is relevant to the internationalization of, of our enterprise. You see, other cities and, and, and countries and counties also need more creativity. We get people who are coming from Malaysia. We get people coming from Indonesia. We get people coming from Vietnam. And if you look at their public offices, their managers would like more creativity and innovation as well. Uh huh. All of a sudden, there's a market. All of a sudden, there's something interesting. So the question then is, what can we offer to all those other places that want creativity? Maybe it's not about the Korean thing that I just heard. Maybe it's some part of that. The real question, then it goes back to us. What can we tell other people about being adaptive and innovative? One of the reasons that I'm here is because, at least I was told, that uh, the civil service of New Zealand is very adaptive and very uh, flexible and very innovative. Now, I know that there's some commentary locally that's, that may question that to some extent, but I actually believe that you are. So then the question is, what do we know about us being innovative and, and, and adaptive and being flexible? What is our story about that? What do we know about ourselves as being innovative people? If you don't have that story, 
you don't have a story to share with the rest of the world, with the people around you in small islands or Papua New Guinea or Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on, so on, so forth. But that is something to, to think about. What do we actually know about ourselves in a way that is relevant for others around, that actually others have a need for? You may, that's, mm, that's just that 10% outside. You know, other things you do are very good for yourself, it's a different story. But this is a story coming from outside, seeing a need that is out there, saying, hmm, what can we develop in this area for ourselves? I might note, by the way, that there's some effort I've been told to promote a, a government IP abroad. Well, you have to have it first. <laughs> let me skip, skip this slide. Let me just, um, I, I know time is moving on, so let me just give a very quick, a quick story from a very different angle from Taiwan. Um, and a, a totally different story. The other one was like internally focused on how to make a bureaucracy more innovative. Well, this is, a, this is more fundamental. This is how to make democracy work. So right now in the world, there's a huge story about how to make democracy work in the Middle East, oh, and in Africa, and where it is in some continents still to make it work better. Making democracy work is a huge story. Now, some, a lot of that story initially focused on, I would say, political science and getting security, how, how, do, how do you do elections that are, that are free and fair, that are, that are clean, all that kind of stuff. Taiwan teaches us another lesson. So this is a contribution of Taiwan to the world. It's about what happens after you do your, your political science right. By the way, in Taiwan, democracy really taken root. I mean, Taiwan and Korea are two models of the world uh, that, that, that uh, democratization can really work. If it's Monday, we should have a demonstration. If it's Tuesday, we should have three. <laughs> um, but along the way, this is what, what, what happened. Now, I don't have fancy pictures for it, so I hope this, this is not too, too boring. But before democratization, there was a one-party system. The KMT was a ruling party. And the bureaucracy in Taiwan were known to be famously innovative and leading and, 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 and inventive and, and just hyper-productive, very productive place. Actually, more so than the companies. The companies went sometimes to the government to learn how they could be so, so inventive. And the system that they had here was that you'd have a minister, a deputy minister, assistant minister like so, that would be the minister, and then you would have senior and middle managers over there. And they would and uh, they would all be part of the same party. I don't know if you had to be a KMT party member to be to be a public manager at that level, but I presume it would have helped. And people were if you wanted to make promotion, you just had to stick up your hands and, and produce results. It was very clear what uh, Taiwan was trying to do, what kind of industries it wanted to develop, what kind of social problems it had. And if you wanted if you were in that role, you stick your hand, you did it and and you got noticed and, and uh, you would be promoted that way. By the way, because many of these people also knew each other, at least some of these people knew, knew, knew each other, it was not uncommon for managers or senior managers to become a minister for a couple of years before going back to being a manager again, and, and like so. Um, it's hard to say exactly when democracy happened in Taiwan, depending on what number you want to pick. A general election in 1996, but the KMT was uh, voted, as, uh, uh, voted in. The first party turnover happened in the year 2000, and the D DPT was elected. By constitutional practice in Taiwan, only the only a couple political appointees can be appointed, a minister and maybe two de deputy ministers. It looks a lot like your Westminster system. There's a lesson here. Westminster system is not as special as what, you, what some people think it is. There are many parallels to other systems that are features that are different, 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 but not but somewhat comparable. And this is one of them, where you have very, very few political officials on the, on the top. And this was very interesting. What did the uh, senior, senior civil servants do? Well, they said, look, we are now politically neutral, so we're not going to come up with initiatives. You are elected. You tell us what to do. <laughs> and by the way, under the democracy, there's a media out there that we didn't have, have before, and we don't want our name in the newspaper. So the question was, how, to, you know, how can you do that way? Well, the reality is you cannot lead a Department of Transportation by two or three top leaders. That's not going to happen. The transportation is so diversified. You know, airports and harbors and highways and bicycle paths, which is, is just not going, going to happen. So there, 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 there needs a different approach there. And Taiwan is teaching us something, something about that today, which is very positive. Before I go on, um, the state of leadership, what has not been done for a long time, which came out of it, is actually looking at what top leaders do. It's old classic, old classic human research management, but, but it, it, no one in America has done this. Um, I'll talk about America in just, just a second. 
But if you look at what top managers do, do I compiled this from job descriptions of, of senior managers. And I will read this a second because it is amazing what we expect our, our top civil servants to do. Um, they need to implement the president's management agenda. They need to provide accountability to legislative bodies. They need to sometimes provide support for legislative proposals. They, they need to provide overall strategic direction to an agency. They need to ensure that all the different divisions and the parts of, of uh, agencies have a strategic goals that are current. They need to also provide leadership in extraordinary crises uh, conditions, think Katrina, and then do your nor normal day job. Um, they, um, uh, they also need to deal with the external com com community and, and, and media. I have no idea where actually top leaders find, job, find time to be leaders. They should be out there so often. You really do, do need the de 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 deputy leaders. You also need to ensure long-term investments in the uh, ca capabilities of, of the eight agencies, which is a very different time horizon of the political uh, officials. You need to ensure coordination with other min min ministries and sometimes jurisdictions. It just goes on and on. You need to manage litigation and legal risks. You need to initiate new uh, strategic projects. You need to manage a multi-billion dollar budget. How many companies manage a multi-billion multi dollar budget? And it just goes on and on and on and on. So this, this is really the task of what it means to be leading a public agency. And for a long time, people of public administration themselves actually have, have not necessarily looked at that, but it's where we are today is the need to focus on top leadership. So one of the things that we did in Taiwan is that this model alone probably does, doesn't work too well, but we, we did think that if, if at all some agencies are going to be good, and actually some are good, there must be an understanding between political officials and senior managers about who does what. This, this would need to, need, need to be just very, very important. And some of the, so one of the things that we were a, able to do in Taiwan is actually survey very senior officials who, in fact, we were a, able to, to get a list and survey all of the officials who report directly to a minister or deputy minister. That alone is a contribution of Taiwan and why doing research abroad is so important. In America, in the federal government, you will not get access to top officials who work for a, a minister or for, 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 for the secretary. In Britain, I don't think you will even know who they are. <laughs> so, so here's a case of a country that makes it possible. So anyway, to make a long story short, we, we, we thought that if they have an understanding with their, their uh, appointees about what each should work on, whether a senior manager could get oversight from the appointee by way of dem 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 democratic accountability, getting support from the appointee, and um, a senior managers letting the appointees know which policy areas they actually want to work on. If people, if the senior managers have that kind of understanding with their minister, it's more likely that some of these other tasks would, would be taken than if they did not. What you see on the chart over there is the white bar that shows actually 50% of senior managers who did not have such an understanding with their minister, deputy minister. Keep in mind that some ministers or deputy ministers only come to work a couple, a couple of hours a week that they show up in, in the office. But others are there full time. There's a lot of variation there, it really is. Just one maybe, maybe difference here is that among those uh, senior managers who said that they did not have such an understanding with their minister, only 41% said that they could affect decisions about how policies are implemented. You're telling me you are a senior manager and you are saying that I cannot affect how policies are implemented in my agency? Well, that apparently is a reality in some places. Yes, yes. But if you do have that understanding, it increases to 74 percent. Almost very similar here in being able to, to frequently develop new innovative programs. And that is where I just want to tie it back to these pictures I showed er earlier. When senior managers are able to have arrangements with their ministers that they can take leadership, these school children are going to get new programs. Their teachers will be better evaluated. They might get to be better classrooms. If they don't have that understanding, those people will not undertake those new programs and initiatives. Likewise, this a new new vaccine being being developed or, or whatever, those new programs will be developed when there is that understanding of leadership initiative taking with their ministers, or it will not. I would I will submit to you that although the press often focuses on what people do wrong, the real story today is not what people do wrong. The real story is what people don't do. Period. It's not what you do wrong, it's what, you, what doesn't get done that matters. What distinguishes great places from, from those that are less is probably what gets done versus what doesn't get done. That is probably the, uh, the story there. I'll, I'll just skip, skip this, but uh, for those who focus on, 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 
leadership and leadership training in the audience, this is not a normal picture you would normally see. Normally we think about agency something like this in a, in a pyramid. But increasingly people are beginning to think, or at least I am beginning to, uh, to think, that we need to have a separate kind of leadership track for political officials who can focus on a few political priorities. And if you think about the long list of all the other tasks to be done, the top managers need to do all the rest. Now it gets interesting, because if this is the reality for leading most eight, eight agencies and not something like this, then, then, then a few questions arise. How do we organize the governance of senior managers to take leadership? There's not much of a literature out there. We haven't from new public management didn't look at that. The government didn't look at that. Not many people have looked at that, that's one. And number two, what are the kinds of people you would like to have taking those roles? What should their background be? What should their skills be? What should their motivations be? In some places, in many, many countries, people are promoted to these roles about two or three years before retirement. Well, this is a reward for great service and increased your retirement. Well, what, is, what kind of innovation or leadership might you get from those people? And how could you keep them accountable for actually undertaking the leadership that is necessary? So the final part then of this sort of long presentation, sorry, is, is a question about the contributions from New Zealand. And I, I, I really think that uh, in New Zealand we have a number of things going on that, that could, make, could, could be that valuable contribution if we did enough research on them. If we, had, if we developed a story to, to tell around them. Uh, very re recently uh, is, is the interest of, of de developing a career boards. The um, a career board process is focused around um, ensuring the uh, succession of senior leaders by identifying and helping to develop um, uh, 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 other, other, other managers by giving them uh, uh, de developmental experiences and following them, them through. It is um, pretty unique actually in involving a process of both the state services uh, commissioner as well as chief executives working in partnership with the uh, leadership uh, de development center to identify these, these in, in individuals and to give them developmental experiences, to give them the kind of experience, the experience and skills that, that you would want people to have at that very senior level. There is no literature on this in the world. It doesn't exist. I think Victoria University should help to develop this. If we don't do this and put this in, in the world, it won't exist. Yet this is hugely relevant to other countries that face a very similar problem. There are many examples of this. Here is uh, some, something that is well, well known to members in this audience, the Performance Improvement Framework, uh, which is a, pro a process through which um, uh, 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 very credible and experienced uh, uh, external members come in and evaluate how well an agency is positioned to tackle the challenges in the upcoming years. It's a sort of strategic planning assessment. What's, uh, what is interesting about this is that these are very detailed reports. Uh, agencies get very detailed traffic lights. This is not just one letter grade, A or B for your agency. This is very, 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 very detailed. And it's put online for the entire pub public to see, and there are recommendations what you need to improve, and people come back two or three years later, or one, one or two years later, and they see whether or not the chief executive actually did this. This is not in the literature. It's as if the rest of the world don't know that, that you do this. Now, granted, this is a model that other places would, 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 would find very difficult to, to develop. Let, let, let me say, there are some articles written, but are they being heard? Just like the Korean example, this may not be something that could be taken off the shelf and put somewhere else, but many other countries are, are suffering the same problems. This is from, a, from an er, earlier example uh, as, as well. So, I, so in the area of leadership that I focus on, I think there are uh, significant opportunities for, for doing research, and I think we should be doing more, more research to, to tell the story to the world. I think that there's a moral re reason for, for doing that, as well as practical reasons. I think the moral reason for us to, to do research is that you cannot only be taken from the world. Much of what any country does, and New Zealand's not different, is that we take from other countries and we try to adapt it and make our, our country better. That is the 90%. But you cannot only take, you have to give too. And so this is the, the process of, of the giving. I think also on a, on a practical level, doing this kind of kind of research also helps you to know more, more helps us to learn more about uh, ourselves, and in that process also improve the re re reputation that we have and the le legacy that we have. 
So there's, there's a lot going going on here, and um, I think, by the way, we, we may just have a, a vehicle for doing more research and making great, greater contributions here. Um, there's um, I wrote a book on performance management some years ago, and in that is something called Berman's Law, in case you wanted to know. So Berman's Law is that no one can be unlucky all the time. <laughs> Sometimes you just come to the institution that just does the right thing when you need it. And I, and I, and I think uh, this may be one of those moments. Um, the Vice Chancellor spoke earlier about the new the strategic uh, uh, directions for, for the university. I want to just highlight a few different things there. Um, but the university will be distinguished internationally. That's the mission, to be distinguished internationally. Uh, by its excellence of both fundamental and applied research. And um, some of the uh, uh, targets for which a multidisciplinary team might be put together, especially on this theme of advancing better government. And the purpose of advancing better government is not only to improve better government here in New Zealand, but also to deepen Victoria University's intellectual influence in the Asia Pacific region. So I would like to submit to you that, that developing research around, around targets of opportunity that others in Asia Pacific see a need for should be a very high priority and something that I stick my hand up for uh, work, working on in the year, years ahead. I've been here for about a year and a half now. It feels just like yesterday, Bob. But uh, here are some, some, some things that we are working on in the School of Government. We are beginning to talk and to plan for an international conference for exchange among practitioners of public administration in Asia Pacific. People do want to come to New Zealand to learn about us, but what there's really a need for is about exchange of dialogue and forming communities of interest around certain topics. Uh, Richard Norman at School of Management, uh, I don't know if you're here, here, here tonight, but he, he's been taking the lead on that. Another thing that we're trying to do is, uh, is increase uh, uh, partnerships on the educational side with leading, in, leading uh, school of governments or similar kind, kinds of departments in Asia Pacific. And um, uh, here is something that uh, Rob uh, helped, 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 helped us on, as well as John, John Davis, who is here, I'm sure, somewhere. Uh, John Davis is the Associate Dean for uh, International and, and Executive ed, 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 Education. And we received a group here from the National Institute of Development Administration of Bangkok, Thailand, and this is the number one school for public administration in Thailand, bar none. P.S. Their master program, program of public administration has over 2,300 students. Okay, so I think a few of them might just want to come here. We, we surely hope so. And maybe a few of our students might do and want to spend a semester in Bangkok too, by the way. Um, and um, so these are the kind of things that we do, and coincidentally or not, uh, it has become possible in the last couple of years to get accreditation for public affairs programs, and they too want to have accreditation for public administration programs, just, just like we are starting to do as well. So one way that we can become more excellent is, is to um, look, look for, for accreditation. There are other things that we can do as well, such as e-learning, which increases access, by the way, not only internationally, but also for students in New Zealand. Imagine how easier it would be for students in Auckland to take our classes, but some part of that is online. I'm not saying we're becoming an e-learning program, but having some e-learning with the uh, surely help. And then there, there, there are some other, other things there. Well, I know that, that I've surely done over my time. Give a professor a microphone, you know. But anyway, this is what I've done, um, this is what I do, and this is what I want, 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 want to do over here. Thank you very much. Business School, and the tradition with um, uh, at Victoria University of Wellington with inaugural lectures, lectures is that the Vice Chancellor introduces the the professor, and uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor has the opportunity to say a few closing remarks and thanks uh, to our inaugural uh, lecturer. So um, I'll take that a few minutes to do that. Um, but I won't take long. Um, Evan has uh, given us um, 
quite a, a wide-ranging lecture this evening about his personal background, about his personal experiences, about his professional experiences. Um, I guess um, one of the key messages to come through to me tonight is uh, one can learn a great deal from one's own experience and what Evan is um, telling us tonight, the message is that there is a great deal to learn from other countries' experiences in public administration and public management. Um, but, and and uh, we, we should be undertaking research to learn that. But also, there is a great deal we can learn from ourselves and share with, with other countries. And um, I'm delighted that Evan is uh, really relishing the opportunity to learn about what, what is happening in New Zealand and what's the opportunity to internationalise that, that knowledge. Um, Evan also took the opportunity, which I'm, I'm pleased he did, and I'm sure the Vice Chancellor is very pleased he did, to connect what he is doing and what he was hired for, actually, with uh, the university's strategic direction and strategic plan. Uh, you will have noticed that um, our new strategic plan, which uh, Grant has worked uh, very hard with um, internally and externally engaging with people to develop a new strategic plan, has amongst some of its priorities um, advancing better government, but also enabling our Pacific Asia Pacific trading nation and Evan's talk tonight connects very very closely to that and um, illustrates the ways in which uh, academics can make those sort of contributions. Um, let me just conclude by saying Evan thank you very much for informing us tonight much more about yourself and, and your wife's background. It was nice to hear about that. The, um, your, your research interests and your vision for where your work will take, take you and how you're connecting back with the university's uh, um, objectives. And what is also very clear to us is that you have a passion for connecting with the wider community as well and drawing on what insights you can from them from the wider community and sharing that. So we very much look forward to um, um, seeing you seeing that develop in the future. So thank you very much for your lecture this evening. On behalf of everyone, it's my opportunity, of the Vice Chancellor, it's also my opportunity to welcome you to, after the uh, talk, to refreshments. Um, so I better get that in before I now ask you to uh, thank uh, Evan for his lecture this evening.